All right, so let's jump on to electrolysis. So we've been through about 40 minutes of redox. We're gonna go through about 30 to 35, maybe more like 30 minutes of electrolysis. Um, and then what we'll do is we will jump into a equilibria. If you need to take a break, feel free to pause and come back. Um, otherwise I'm gonna jump straight into electrolysis. I'll probably take a break. So you see a little cut in between electrolysis and equilibria, but that's uh, these slides here, essentially here, if you wanna take a break, quickly pause and then come back. So let's talk about electrolysis. So electrolysis is essentially where we sort of reverse redox. We do the opposite. So consider the following chemical equation here. We've got solid sodium and we've got chlorine gas. It, this is a spontaneous, highly exothermic reaction. Um, it's a really, really dangerous reaction. It's actually not very safe, um, but it's a really spontaneous reaction. So if you put these two things in the same environment, you will get NaCl. Now, what if we had NaCl and we wanted to separate it back? Now, NaCl is really common. It's just table salt, it's everywhere. How do I convert it back into these two products? This for a very, very long time was impossible. We never knew how to do this. For a very long time, we sat there and went, uh, I don't think this is possible. I don't think there's a way to do this. We know how to obviously create it, but to go the other way is just way too hard and it's far too dangerous. And it's an issue we had for a very, as I said, a very, 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 very long time. <laughs> but now we know how to do it. And we do it through what we refer to as electrolysis. Now, electrolysis involves the supply of electrical energy through a conducting liquid. So this causes redox reactions that are non-spontaneous to occur. As the, reactant don't, as the reactants don't typically react, they can be placed in the same cell because we're not worried about them reacting with each other. So they're not going to spontaneously react. They're not going to get a direct reaction. So we can just chuck them in the same cell and just leave them there for a bit. And then we can force them to react. And by forcing them to react, we get what we want. So think of this as the opposite to, galva to galvanic cells. So we have chemical energy to electrical energy. That is our galvanic cells. We're now gonna convert electrical energy back into chemical energy. That's electrolytic cells. So this is a very common example of what an electrolytic cell looks like. You have your electrolyte, which can be aqueous or molten. doesn't really matter what it is, but that's got everything in it. You've got an anode and you've got a cathode. From here, you supply some power. Now, really important, the negative side of power has electrons going towards it uh, or going towards the negative side, positive side has electrons coming away from it, essentially. Um, in terms of like, if this is your positive side, you've got electrons going that way to your negative side. Now, what's really important here is everything is essentially flipped. The anode becomes positive, the cathode becomes negative. So the cat doesn't like electrolysis, cats don't like electricity, therefore it is negative. Sort of how I think about it. So cathode becomes negative, anode becomes positive. Notice how electrons are still going anode to cathode. Electrons will always go anode to cathode, that does not change. Now, electrolysis, despite being non-spontaneous and top, right, bottom, left, and that's something that we will talk about, it'll use top, right, bottom, left, we will still use the strongest oxidant and the strongest reductant. So no matter what, we are going to use the strongest reductant and the strongest oxidant. That is just the reality of this situation. We will always still utilize them. So it is important to understand that despite being described as the opposite of standard redox, the electrolysis still falls and falls, follows many of the standard rules. These include the anode is the side of oxidation, the cathode is the side of reduction, and that the electrons flow from anode to cathode. So all of these rules still apply. There's no change to these rules at all. So it's important you sort of stick with these and don't change these up. Um, but there are some distinct differences and that's super important to understand as well. The most important is that the involved species are found top right and bottom left or next to each other. The anode is now positive, the cathode is now negative. So here's a really good table. You're welcome to come back to this and look at it whenever you would like. Um, it's available here on the slide. You can take a screenshot of it if you would like. It's got galvanic and your electrolytic processes and what are the differences between the two. I'm not gonna go through it, but you're welcome to utilize it. So remember this example from earlier. In this example, we discussed that if magnesium two plus and Zn solid were placed in a cell setting, no reaction would occur. So we talked about this 
a little while back, uh, twenty minutes ago, and I said, "Hey, you're not going to get a reaction here. So these two, these two here, you're not going to get a reaction. It's not going to happen." However, in electrolysis, this is different. Given our electrolytic cells are not separated, if I placed Mg2 plus and Zn in together, nothing would happen until I apply power. And that's exactly what we want. But once this begins to run, Mg solid and Zn2 plus form, which would lead to spontaneous reaction back. So that is direct in nature. So what I'm trying to say here is that if I had a beaker, so if I get my rubber out, I want to get rid of that with my eraser. I want a razor. So if I said to you that I put one beaker, I get one beaker and I fill it with, I fill it with Zn solid and I, well, it's a different green, that's okay. And Mg2 plus, nothing happens. I then apply some electricity and I go through electrolysis and they flip over and I get Zn2 plus forming and I get Mg solid forming. I now have a spontaneous reaction possible. They are still in the same beaker. So what's going to happen? I'm going to get a direct reaction. I'm going to get heat energy and it's not going to be useful. So despite this, we still have to sort of somehow separate these and we still have to work out how we're going to change what's going on. And it's important because secondary cells are really complex like that. So secondary cells are super complex. Sometimes they're in the same beaker, sometimes they are not. And it's determining what is going to be produced and where it's produced as to what is going to happen. Um, so electrolytic cells are quite difficult to work with and so we'll discuss that as we go through but if we consider a mixture here and we have all of these things and if i look at this electrochemical series i say hey what's going to be react so i apply some electricity and i have all of these things present well what's important is i'm going to have these two here react no sorry yeah these two here because this is the strongest oxidant and this is the strongest reductant now, the only reason this was present was because these were all aqueous. Aqueous, 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 aqueous. Because they're all aqueous, I'm going to have some water present. And because I have water present, I therefore get reaction of my water. So, as you can see here, water is the strongest reductant and as such is oxidized into O2 gas. So... K2+, plus, H+, plus, K+, plus, and H2O can be reduced at the cathode. Cu2+, plus is the strongest oxidant, and as such is reduced at the CO solid. So, despite the fact you can have these products go through everything, you end up with the H2O and the copper 2+. Plus. And now, maybe you wanted the copper 2+, plus to go through it and produce CO solid. But maybe you didn't. Maybe you didn't want this to, to happen. You didn't want the H2O to go through and form O2 gas. So therefore, you're gonna to have to consider things like molten mixtures to remove H2O. So especially when we go through electrolysis, H2O is a bit of an issue, and we start to discuss what about molten versus aqueous. Now, this is a good practice question here, because it sort of goes through, hey, in an aqueous solution of containing a mixture of this and this, and it was electrolyzed using unreactive electrodes, what is gonna happen? What's gonna happen at the anode? So I want you to have a go at this question, I want you to pause the video, take yourself a minute or two and have a go. I'm not going to wait. I will just go straight into the answer. That's why I suggest three, two, one, pause. And now hopefully you've had a go at this question and come back. So if we look at this question, we've got calcium ions, we've got bromine ions, and we've got potassium ions and iodide ions. So if I go back and I find all these things in here, which I'm not going to bother doing, I would find that, you know, you've got your iodide ions here, Bromide ions here, I should be using a different color, but that's okay. I've got potassium ions all the way down here. And what was my other thing? Calcium ions. I don't even think calcium is on here. So it doesn't really matter. I don't think calcium, oh no, calcium is on here. Calcium is down here. So strongest oxidant is going to be my calcium. So calcium is going to be reacted. It's going to go through reduction. It's going to be at my cathode. But this question is asking what's happening at the anode. So which of these is my strongest reductant? That is my Ci minus or my iodide ions uh, going to iodine. And therefore I get my answer being D. So as you can see here, this is a good explanation of it. The answer here is D. 
So then we go on to discuss exactly what I said before. What about molten versus aqueous? So what about when we have this issue where we've got molten and aqueous uh, solutions? So as you can see here, this is a molten solution. This is a liquid. There is no water present. This has been heated up to a very high temperature to remove all the water. And now we've only got sodium and chloride. What species are present? Well, there's only sodium and chloride. What is the strongest oxidant? Sodium. What is the strongest reductant? Chloride. So what is going to happen? I'm going to form sodium solid and I'm going to form chlorine ions. Oh, chlorine gas, sorry. Now what about here? Well, now I've actually got H2Os present. So I've got these H2Os present because I am aqueous. So what happens if I go through electrolysis? Well, my strongest oxidant is H2O and my strongest reductant is also H2O. So I get H2O reacting with H2O, which is completely useless. And that's what happens in these situations here. So water is being preferentially reduced and oxidized in this situation here. And that's not what we want. We want to avoid this pretty much at all cost. So essentially in these situations here, you need to consider the idea that molten versus aqueous needs to occur. When are we going to use molten? When are we going to use aqueous? And why? And that's because water is present on this list. Water is everywhere on this list. These are the two you're going to work with. This one here, you can also work with the issue is you need, it needs to say that oxygen gas is present. If it doesn't state it, then you cannot use this one here. So really important that this one doesn't get used unless it states that oxygen uh, gas is present. As you can see here, you can use this because this is the only thing that's on the left side and this is the only thing that's on the right side. So you can use these ones because it doesn't need to say if anything else is there. Very good. All right, so another practice question. I think the best way to learn electrolysis is to continue doing practice questions. I find this is probably the strongest and, and best way you can go about this stuff. So it says here, a student is investigating the relationship between the amount of charge used in electrolysis and the mass of metal formed using three beakers. And it says here that you've got the student performs an electrolytic reaction and you've got these things here. But how do I determine what is going on here? So this question is actually, I think this question is going to be further back. I do apologize. This question is going to be further back. So this question we'll come back to. This question is actually meant to be at the end of this topic. So we'll come back to it, don't worry. Um, primary cells. So let's now quickly talk about, before we jump into the math side of things, which is this question here, this is the math side of things and Faraday's laws, and we will talk about this question, don't you worry. If I talk about primary cells and I talk about secondary cells, what am I talking about? Well, primary cells are essentially non-reusable cells, and these are essentially fuel cells and singular galvanic cells. Now, primary cells have irreversible reactions. You cannot turn them back. You cannot take what was produced and form it back into a fuel or whatever it was that was, eventually, was, was the reactants initially. Secondary cells, on the other hand, are able to be reused because the electrochemical reaction that occurred in these cells is reversible. So these are made up of galvanic and electrolytic components uh, so as you can see here, we have a chemical energy, electrolytical energy, we have discharge versus recharge, and secondary cells have discharge and recharge, and it's something that is an important way of distinguishing what is going on in a cell and whether something is a secondary cell. Now, also really important, these are made up of a galvanic component. There was a question, I think it was the 2018 or 2019 exam, VCAR exam. The first multiple choice question was, what is present in both a secondary and a primary cell? And the answer was a galvanic cell. Because a galvanic cell is present in both. In a primary and a secondary cell, a galvanic component is present. It goes through re or discharge, where it goes from chemical energy to electrical energy, and that process is a galvanic process. That is a galvanic cell. So there is a galvanic cell as part of a primary cell and a secondary cell, and that is a really important wording. So secondary cells must meet specific requirements in order to recharge. So these specific requirements, you must be able to recite on the exam. So the products of discharge must exist in a reversible form, and the products of discharge must remain in contact with the electrodes. If one of the products of discharge is a gas, for example, 
it's not going to be able to be reversible. Why is that? Because the gas just leaves and heads off into the ether. Yes, you can sort of trap it there, but even so, it's not going to be in direct contact with the electrode all the time. And it doesn't work all that well. So gases are generally terrible for secondary cells. So we don't want gases. We generally want solids. Liquids are okay. Solids are better. That's what we sort of say. Now, during recharge, the anode and the cathode flip sides. So what was the anode becomes the cathode. What was the cathode becomes the anode. We then have a flip of charges, which means the charge actually stays the same at each side. So this used to be the cathode and was positive, is now the anode and you would think negative, but it's actually now positive. So it stays positive on the sides. The anode remains the side of oxidation, the cathode is the side of reduction. The electrons continue to flow anode to cathode. So this is a really good way of doing this diagram. So I drew this diagram out. It's very simple. I just drew some, some boxes and a little circuit. As you can see here, you've got your anode, you've got your cathode. And then what happens is that this is, well, this is in discharge. This is our galvanic component of our secondary cell. We're in discharge. We're producing electricity. Bang. We now become the cathode. We now become the anode. Now, notice these half equations haven't flipped over. So they should have flipped over. I do apologize. That's my bad. They should have flipped. So don't worry about these half equations. Um, but essentially, these half equations should flip. So essentially you should have this now going the other way. So actually the better way of doing this, and I do apologize, um, I should have, I thought I edited that, but I didn't apparently. Um, the best way of visualizing this, if I get this rubber out and I go, let's go here and we go, yeah. and I get rid of this and I draw an arrow that way. That is a terrible arrow. This one goes that way. So as you can see, this now has essentially the electrons on the product side, which should be the right side. So this has now become oxidation, which is at the anode and is positive. This, the electrons have moved to the reactant side which should essentially be the left side, but essentially these electrons are being gained. So it's reduction, it's at the cathode, but it's now negative. So really important that you do flip this equation. I'm gonna make sure I go ahead and I'll edit this before I upload the slide. So you guys have this edited on the slides. I do apologize, it shouldn't be, uh, this should be the other way around. But nonetheless, this is a really good example. Um, when you look at this example here, so that goes like that and that goes like that. A really good example of discharge versus recharge, other than the fact I got that I forgot to put those equations. Um, but secondary cells in everyday life are referred to as rechargeable batteries, um, much like the ones used inside your laptops and phones. However, all these batteries have a lifespan. Um, so why do batteries degrade? This is another thing you need to be able to discuss on an exam. So you need to discuss the idea that if our materials in an electrolytic cell need to stay as like a they need to stay in contact with the electrode. What if you know you drop your phone and a bit of the material flicks off and, and can no longer get in contact with the electrode? Well, it can no longer be utilized in the reaction. You've lost a bit of your chemical energy, therefore you have lost a bit of your rechargeability. So loss of active materials from the electrode is a really common example. Um, formation of crystals on the electrode, reducing the surface. Uh, they also increase, re increase resistance to flow. So they reduce the surface area available, they increase the resistance to flow, this will degrade the battery. Formation of interfering species by side reactions. So sometimes you get other things in your battery, they form some side reactions, things that we don't exactly want, but we can't really stop happening. This does happen a bit, and therefore you also get um, some degradation of the battery. And then just things like corrosion and failure of internal components. So essentially battery de degradation is really important to understand that your battery will never be perfect over a long time span. 